Diddy and the music industry. If you guys are on any of these apps, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, uh, you're seeing many people come forward, many victims come forward sharing the abuse that they suffered at the hands of P. Diddy. And the person who opened this conversation to all is Cassie. And so first of all, I want to send so much love and healing to Cassie for her strength to come forward and speak on these things. Um, It takes a lot because so many people that have fallen victim to, you know, the music industry and it's power hungry and passive men um most people never come forward they never share their story they never seek legal action and she had the strength to do that and so thank you cassie thank you thank you for coming forward because now it's opening a conversation about the music industry and how how it has been built off of power hungry and passive men so these allegations and i'm not going to say allegations because diddy obviously paid her out because he is he knew it would be a benefit for him to not go to trial because he was obviously guilty of these crimes and the sad thing about this is that diddy is just one little freckle in the music industry of men and women that live off of the power of extorting others right and I was like Cassie just wanting to be an artist in the music industry I used to be the little girl watching you know Britney Spears and MTV and Hollywood on the TV and just dreaming of this life. I remember when I was young, my sister and me went to Christina Aguilera concert and I like cried when I was there because I just so badly wanted to be a singer. And you know, it's you have these dreams and these goals and these ambitions when you're young and you get involved in this industry that does not have your best interests at heart, does not care that you have a dream all they really want is to use you and abuse you you know there this industry is built again off of power hungry and passive men when i say passive men it's that you know there there's so many men that are just there and involved in the abuse they just stand there and watch it happen and they don't do anything about it and you know understandably they just want to be artists as well or they want to be producers or they want to be involved in the industry in some type of way but by not saying anything by being passive you are just as much a part of that abuse as anybody else and um there's no protector and provider men in that industry there's no protector men right a man in his highest potential of himself is a protector and a provider And the music industry is built off of extorting men as well so that they don't have these protector provider roles, but that they just keep their head down and be in a more passive role. To climb the ladder in the industry, you have to be a part of the boys club. And if you're not a part of the boys club, you're not in any type of way going to be successful in this industry. Um... And so Diddy's downfall is really just the domino effect that has occurred from R. Kelly's downfall. And we're starting to see a shift in power dynamics where victims, uh, people that have been involved in the industry that have experienced uh, suffering in any type of the sense are getting confident to come forward and share their stories and I'm gonna share a little bit of my own because this is really how the industry works and you know for years it's been a rumor that people have spoken about what really goes on in the industry like what really happens so you have to do terrible things to be a part of the industry right we hear this all the time and unless you've been a part of it yourself you wouldn't understand what that really means so I'm going to share a little bit about my own stuff that I've experienced and I remember when I first heard like oh you got to do things to be in the industry I had just moved to Toronto I never really understood what that meant because again it's like a rumor you hear 
uh, but you never really experience it yourself. So, you know, I so badly wanted to be a part of the industry. And there was one particular like A&R producer, whatever guy in Toronto. And I remember um, he he told me to come to a meeting and there was a few meetings that we'd already had. So I was already comfortable with him. And these meetings that we had had were around people out for lunch and, you know, around people in the studio and stuff. And so there was another meeting that he wanted to have. And he had invited me to this address and it ended up being his house. And when I got there, he was the only one there. And I remember feeling so uncomfortable knowing that they say, you know, you have to do things to be a part of this industry. He actually said to me in that moment when we were alone in his house, he said, you know, you're going to have to do stuff with me if you want to work because that's just how the industry works. And I just remember like his breath, like he smoked cigarettes. And so and he was like breathing on me as he was speaking. And I'll never forget that's like burned in my brain, just the smell. And like that smell like gave me a migraine immediately because I was just It was just so disgusting like um, and he was so close to me you know kind of coming up on me and I was so uncomfortable and I remember like just trying to come up with any type of excuse because I was so uncomfortable it was very vulnerable in that situation Um, and I said oh I, I just I just left the gym like I don't feel I just I just got out of the gym I'm all sweaty and he he opened the door to his bathroom And turn the shower on and he goes, well, you can take a shower. I just remember like feeling so grossed out. Um, Immediately like left. I was like, no, I can't. And it was like the choice between doing that and not doing that was what my career was. It was going to decide the direction of my career, whether it was even going to happen or not. So when I left, I knew that was it, right? And I kind of had to just accept that. Uh, he really creeped me out. He was really gross. So I was like, no, that's not it for me. It'll be something else. I'll figure it out, you know? And I immediately just, it, it was revealed to me that that is truth. That if you want to be anything in the industry, mind you, this person, this a and had great success uh, working with OVO and such. And so I knew that that was what the industry was about. After that meeting at his house, I, I figured it out. I understood. And these power hungry and passive men are so good, especially these power men that like thrive on power and vulnerability of of people because it's not just girls it's also boys that are you know victims of these circumstances I just knew that he was so good at what he was doing like he really knew how to get what he wanted right because he just had a really smart way about um, articulating things and you just know when somebody has done this before you know, it's not like their first time. And so that was just one instance. Uh, after that, like a year, maybe two years later, you guys, if you watch my last podcast, I speak about, you know, the plastic surgery that I had in Florida. So I actually ended up in Florida. And when I was in Florida, I got my BBL. I was feeling so good about myself. And let me just add one more thing like these power hungry men they smell vulnerable women they smell when you're vulnerable like if you have a dream they will hold that above you uh, over, they will dangle it over your head like a carrot and so I so badly wanted to do my music stuff I'd been working on it for years I just was I felt like I just needed the team I was like if I have a team of people then it will take off um, and so I'm in Florida and I meet this or I met, met this guy and he did music and he's like you know what that guy over there you should meet him he's a he's a manager and he has like this managing company and he knows everybody he's like well known in this in Miami 
And I was like, okay. So I went over and mind you, I used to be so like go getter, like confident uh, (laughs) when it came to things like that. So I went over, I spoke with him and he was like, all right, I would love to hear your music. I had the look, you know, I'm different. I'm exotic looking. I just got my BBL. I looked like a baddie. He was like, I want to hear your music. Okay, cool. Showed him my music. He was actually very impressed. And from that moment forward, for the next two weeks that I was in Miami, this man took me out to every hot spot in Florida, every hot spot in Miami, like everywhere we went, everybody knew him, everywhere we went, everybody was high-fiving him, what's up, bro, giving him free shit, bottles, shouting him out over the DJ, Uh, and because of that, like I'm from Vancouver Island, Canada, like all I ever knew was like what Hollywood and MTV ever showed me. I was in a totally different reality, in a totally different world where this just him living the life in Miami and being the man in Miami made me feel like he actually was the man in Miami because he was you know Uh, everywhere we went everybody knew him and he was getting everything right so the idea that I had of him was like yeah he's really like he really is that guy right and he had an apartment on South Beach really nice apartment he had an Escalade he had a driver He had this other spot in Fort Lauderdale that was like his trap house, he called it. And I believed him. I believed every ounce of him that he was telling the truth about who he was and that he was actually somebody that could help me because he had another artist that was also under him doing very well. And he showed me all their music and I was very impressed So in my mind, I'm convinced this is it. This is really it. And, you know, he really, really convinced me that he was going to help build my career because he believed in me. And that's all you ever want to hear when you want to be, you know, the next big artist is that somebody believes in you and that they they believe in your talent and that they want to help you get there. So he wrote a contract for me. He made me a contract a two-year management deal with him and I signed it I signed it to be his artist I went back to Canada I packed all my things and I moved down to Florida when I got to Florida I was at his trap house and immediately it was like the energy completely changed he got rid of his Miami apartment And he got rid of the Escalade. And I just felt like that that was a little odd. I knew that was a little odd. But again, like I had such high hopes for my music career. So I really put the faith in him to, you know, make it happen. Right. And I was living at this house with him. And it was like the first week I was there, he was still painting this picture of like, everything's going to be great. We're going to work on your music. He was even like spoiling me a bit, like treating me like, you know, really good. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I I feel so appreciated as an artist. Like this is going to be great. And then I remember the tone changed after the first week and he was like, okay, well, you're here now and you got to work like you got to dance like you gotta you gotta go to the club now and you gotta bring money back and that was not what I had signed up for so I was shocked uh I was confused but I so badly again wanted my music career and had put this trust in this person to make it happen so I was like, okay, fair, because, you know, I'm a person that likes to work anyways. I I didn't like to dance or be in the strip club stripping, but I like to have my own money. And I've always been like that because I, I like to spend money on myself. I like to buy nice food and good food and stuff. And so it was, yeah, I agreed to that. And, uh, I remember the first night that he took me to the club to work, I, worked for you know the eight hours or whatever I got in the car he picked me up and I remember he opened the like the the middle console he just opened it and he was like just put the money in there and I just remember like gathering all my money and just being like this is so it felt so wrong like I was resisting in my spirit my soul was resisting uh 
to put the money in there because I was like, it was like a fuck you. Like in my spirit, I'm like, fuck you. Because I knew what this was now, you know? Like I was like, oh, you're a fucking pimp, you know? <laughs> um, so I ended up doing that because again, like the power dynamic that this person had, this, I was very vulnerable and I also trusted this person. So having this trust for that person and, you know, respecting him in some weird way, uh, I put the money in the console and I remember I kind of fussed about it a bit, but he, his tone completely changed and it was like, you're not going to fuss about this. This is really how things are going to go now. And for the next few months, I was living in my own hell where first of all I hated being in the club dancing I hated it more than anything I actually sucked at it so um you actually the dancers that make money in the club they do rooms they you know they're good at it they're flirty they talk with guys they're confident in that way I was the opposite I didn't want to be there I fucking hated myself I was like what is my life I was really depressed so I barely made any money like I barely made any money. I was scraping by to pay my house fee, which in Florida is like 80 bucks a night. I was scraping by to make that. And I really would just go to work and get drunk and then just sit there and like spiral in my own depression and make whatever money I could possibly make um, doing just dances because I didn't do room. Um, and he started to get really mad at me because I wasn't making money for him. And mind you, when I moved down there, the idea was that I was going to be living in that apartment on South Beach and that he was going to be staying in his trap house. So I had no idea that that was how things were going to work out, that we were going to be like living together. And so I had to just be around him all the time. And like I just my spirit was like I couldn't stand him like he was a pimp. He's a pimp and he was evil, mean, yet he would like make me like like we I would be so depressed and then he would be like well I got you a massage so you're gonna go for a massage today and then I would go have a massage and I would be kind of like happy for the second thinking like oh I'm being spoiled you know it's such a trauma bond and you would have to understand psychology to understand how somebody grows an attachment in a situation like this to somebody to their abuser but there was this attachment there I'm in a whole different country in a whole different place he's the only person that I really have. He's also my abuser. There's an attachment there. I look to him for my safety. I look to him for direction in some sense of the way because I I don't know anyone. I have nobody there. And so it's just a very confusing psychological mind fuck to really understand how somebody gets into situations like this. And this is why I completely understand why Cassie stayed for so long especially being that she had so much um she had fame already and being with him she had fame and her music contract was with him and so whatever abuse that she was suffering at that time she stayed there was a trauma bond there because of that contract that she had in place and the people that were making money off of her having that contract right there is such a a tie to being there and your mind can't grasp being outside of that reality because of the ties that you have there and the people that are relying on you for me it was that I told my friends and people back home that this was happening and I was going to be here and I was going to be successful so there's this whole story that I have in my mind of like I can't leave because this has to work right and I'm sure in some sense of the way that's also kind of how Cassie felt is you know, she had to stay because her family is relying on her. She's already famous. She's Cassie. You know, she's with Diddy. She's with Bad Boy Records. And, and, you know, she couldn't see a life outside of that because the abuse takes you through this roller coaster of emotions that ties you in to that situation. And it's, it's really hard to leave. And so for me, the the more that I went to work and didn't bring money home and the more depressed I got, uh, the more mad he got. And so, you know, he would get drunk and beat me and, and stuff. So 
that was stuff that I suffered. Uh, there was one night I remember in the car, I reached out to one of my best friends in Toronto who I hadn't spoke to in a while and we were just speaking on the phone and he, he got so mad because I didn't want to go into the club with him to meet Trey Songs. At that point, I didn't give a fuck who Trey Songs was. I didn't give a F who anybody was because I was so depressed. Like, I didn't, I'd didn't. i seen through the illusion of what fame was. I'd seen through that illusion. I I didn't care for the celebrity. I never put celebrities on a pedestal in the first place. Like, never in my life did I. So for him to be like, we need to go meet Trey Songs, And then for me to say, I don't want to meet Trey Songs. I want to stay in the car. You can go meet. You can go see Trey Songs. He got really mad. And I was on the phone when he came out the club and his thing was fear tactics so he would want to control everything I was doing he wanted to make sure that he knew who I was speaking to on the phone and uh when I was on the phone and he came back to the car he got really mad and he ended up punching my the side of my head and I hit the the car window really hard to a point that like I still have a bump on my forehead there's a there's a bump right here on my forehead you might even be able to see it in this video if you're watching this on YouTube and so yeah he punched me and my phone fell on the ground and I was so embarrassed that I told my friend she's like what happened and I'm like "Uh, I gotta call you tomorrow and that was the night that he beat me for the first time and all the while I still had to go to work and I was living in my own hell it was really just a terrible terrible feeling and so these men like it doesn't matter what level of the industry they're in if they smell vulnerability on a woman woman or a man they will extort you they will traffic you they will use you and It will be to their benefit. It won't be for your benefit to for your career. You know, this is such a common story. And this is why I I never want to call myself a victim. I'm not a victim. Any of you listening that want to say, oh, I'm so sorry that that happened to you, please don't. Because I truly believe that everything happens for a reason. I truly believe that I had to experience that in my life for me to be the version that I am today. And so I will never pity myself for the things that I've experienced. And and um, there's one more thing I wanted to share. This There's like similarities in Cassie's story, which was kind of like blew my mind a bit because I was like, wow, I, I kind of know what she was. Well, I do know what she was feeling because I was feeling those similar things when I was going through my own stuff. Um, like I'd said, the the pimp, he wanted to control everything my phone who I was speaking to I have two more stories about how crazy he is um so there was one day I have my dad saved in my phone as daddy because I'm daddy's girl and I've always been daddy's girl my parents are amazing and my dad's amazing and so I'm going to share in another podcast how I ended up in a situation like this even though I was raised with love because it's very confusing for people to understand but this is why I believe that I, I specifically me had to go through this because I'm here to help so many people, um, you know, prevent their children from growing up and being in situations like this. So there's one day in particular, he looked at my phone and he saw daddy and he freaking cussed me out and was like, you have a, you've had a pimp, you have a pimp. And like, he was snapping on me and I was like trying to explain to him that that was my father in my phone that I've always called my dad daddy and he was freaking snapping on me and he was like call him right now call him right now and I just remember feeling so much shame like so embarrassed and so sad in that moment because I didn't want my I wanted to protect my dad and my mom from ever knowing anything that was going on I never wanted them to worry or stress about me ever Uh, so I lived a very private life and so I remember calling my dad and I never called my dad like I would always text my dad Or it would be like holidays, we would speak on the phone, but we would text, but I would never call him out of the blue like that. So 
my dad knew immediately something was wrong because I never called him. And I just remember like my voice sounded like sad and he was worried. My dad was really worried. I could tell it in his voice. He was like, is everything okay? Like what's going on? You know? And I was like, yeah, everything's fine, dad. Like choked up. I was like choking up, almost crying. I was like, everything's good, dad. Yeah. Um, I just miss you. That's all. And that's something I'll never forget because I just like my parents are just so sweet and I just always wanted to protect them from everything that I had experienced, you know. Um, So that was one moment. I just see 777 right here. That's so crazy. Um, And then the last thing I'm going to share. This was crazy. <laughs> this is how crazy these motherfuckers are. Excuse my language. This is, there's going to be uh, explicit <laughs> content in this one. Um, so I remember after he had beat me the first time and I had that big boulder on my forehead, he made me go to work. He was like the next day he came. I remember he came into the bedroom. I was sleeping in the bedroom and he put like this ointment on my forehead was trying to be all nice and like oh every- I'm so sorry I was just you know just drunk and this and that and I was like get the fuck away from me basically but I just I don't know I was very vulnerable in that moment so we had a day whatever we did whatever like and I remember at night he was like well you gotta work tonight you know, like you haven't been bringing money in and you got to work. And I just remember like he so badly wanted me to escort, like he so badly wanted me to like escort and I wouldn't. So he would just push me and push me and push me to be at the club more and more because I like, like I said, I sucked. I was, I, I was a terrible dancer. I made no fucking money. Um, you know, you think, oh, when you're a dancer, you make so much money and it's like, wow, you're just living this life. No, I was a terrible dancer. I made no money because I didn't want to be there. You can't make money when you don't want to be somewhere. I was sitting in the corner like I didn't want anyone to touch me. I was already being like abused and like had so much stress and was going through so much immense mentally and emotionally and physically that I just I didn't want anyone any guys especially talking to me so that really affected me making money and it really pissed him off so that meant uh I need you to go to work tonight and I remember like I didn't want to be anywhere fucking close like anywhere near him so I was like yeah I'm I'm going to work tonight don't you worry get me the f out of here I don't want to be anywhere close to you so I remember that night going to work And I just didn't want to be anywhere near him. So I basically just sat in the same chair at work all night. And I didn't make a dollar. (laughs) Like I literally didn't even care. I was like, whatever. I just didn't want to be around him. And I remember specifically that night too, the club was empty. So I wasn't going to make any money anyways. And... I remember I didn't want him to pick me up. I didn't want to be anywhere close to him. So I just said to him, don't bother picking me up because he got really mad when I said there's nobody in the club and I'm probably like there's no one here. He got like pissed. He was like, well, you better make some money and bring that shit home. And I was like, well, there's nobody here and don't bother picking me up because I don't want to be anywhere near you. And he got pissed when I said that. So that night I ended up calling an Uber and the uber driver took me home and when i got back to the house his car was gone so i thought he was at the club i'm like oh this guy's not here like whatever so i go inside i let the dogs out he had two dogs and i remember making food i was wasted i was making food just talking to the dogs i was like your daddy ain't shit i was like he's such an asshole i was just talking to the dogs because If you guys know me and you've spent time with me or you've seen me talk to my cats like or you've seen me on social media with animals and babies like I'm like a freaking crazy person and I talk to them like they're the cutest little things I've ever seen in their life you know like and that's just how I am. So that's how I was being with them and they were kind of like my little safe space when I was living in that house is like you know the animals they they're really calming so I was talking to the dogs and he wasn't there he wasn't there his car wasn't there there was nobody in the house he's not there mind you this man also has a gun and he would put it beside the bed so that was another fear tactic that he had he slept with the gun beside the bed um 
And so I got ready for bed and I got in bed and I'm laying in bed just on Instagram and whatever, YouTube. And I remember turning, put my, put my phone down to go to sleep, turn all the lights off. I'm laying in bed and I hear like noises and I'm like, what the hell is that? Then he busted out the closet, you guys. This crazy ass man busted out of the closet. He was hiding in the closet. For like three hours, he was hiding in the closet, listening to me, like waiting for me to get on the phone and call someone. And he was in the freaking closet. He busted out the closet. He came at me, choked me, was like, who who drove you home? Like he thought that someone drove me home. And it was the Uber driver. And I had to like show him on my phone that I had proof that it was Uber. It was so crazy. And yeah, he was a psychopath. He would come into the club while I was working and like be in the corner, like watching me and texting me. And yeah, it was just such a crazy time in my life where it's like God needed me to be a prisoner, like to be a slave, to realize like who I am, like who I really am, like remember who I really am, like the complete polar opposite of being a slave is a f- freedom, right? To be free, freedom of the mind. And I had to experience that so that I could find my way back to myself and really learn to love myself and become the best version of myself. And so all of that, you know, and no music. And I just wanted to still do the music. And I continued to make music. Oh, you guys are going to ask how I left. I ended up telling him that I had to leave America because my passport was going to expire and if I didn't go I would have overstayed and so I have to go and then I'll come back and he agreed to that so I left all my stuff there I packed one small bag and mind you I had moved my whole life down there so I left with just one bag to my name I left everything with him and I left and when I went back to Canada I was a shell of a person I was so disconnected from like myself I was numb I was numb I was numb I know what that feels like I could see it in Cassie's eyes and some of those photos of her and I know what that's like I know when I look at somebody and they're numb I know that there's something going on there you know and I was that person. I was so numb. I I just felt so empty inside, you know, to have this big dream and this excitement and this goal of mine and then have somebody be like, yeah, this is this is going to happen and, you know, tell you that they believe in you and that the, it's going to be amazing. And then you go there and then the idea that you had is just, you know, falls to your knees and it's 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 a big pile of shit. It's not real, but it really opened my eyes to the industry and to see how things are really done because it's all an illusion. It's all built on illusion. It's built on power hung. It's built off of the vulnerability of artists and engineers and producers and it's the same in the, you know, the Hollywood and and acting industry and such right these entertainment industries it's it's all the same it's built off of power hungry and passive men passive men being the men that stand there and watch it happen and don't do anything they do not do anything because they would rather put their head down and keep their job which you know it's understandable again that's its own form of extortion right your job is only protected if you are complicit and don't say anything and so this abuse has been able to go on for so long and God is shifting the dynamic the power dynamic in the world that you know all these narcissistic covert narcissistic and you guys know I hate using that word uh, 
people that have been in power are now the roles are reversing and the power is, is being put in the hands of the people that have been fallen victim to the circumstances uh, that they've created for us, right? So the, there is an ending to labels. The music industry is crumbling. And the industry, again, it's built off of power hungry and passive men that no longer have power. And so you're seeing a big shift in the the power dynamic in the industry where independent artists are now thriving. You have TikTok as a tool, YouTube, all these outlets and platforms for artists to be their own boss, be their own label, have their own success without needing to rely on a label to be successful because for years you could not be successful without a label. And that simply no longer exists. So to be honest with you, if I wanted to make music and put it out right now, I, I have all the tools to do that. I mean, you guys hear my song at the end or at the beginning of all my podcasts. I post that song. Uh, it's called 777. I wrote it myself. And that's me singing. And yeah, I wrote that song. I, I mean, I've been making music for years. I remember playing the piano when I was like 10 and just singing and writing songs. And that was always my passion and my love for that. And I've done so much stuff with music even before I pursued the industry. I was in a band in high school. I, you know, traveled the world with them. I sang in the Cavern Club where the Beatles were discovered. I opened up for The Temptations. I was the very first song of the night. I have such a history of music that you know, just brings so much joy to my heart and my soul. And it's such a passion of mine. And to have that passion ripped and torn apart by these power hungry and passive men in the industry. Um, well, they didn't ruin it because, you know, as you heal and gain your power back, you then can put, you know, practice to those things that bring you joy again. And, you know, they don't have any power over me. Nothing in my past has power over me. I've actually forgave that person who did those things to me because again, when you heal and you detach and you detach and you see yourself as a separate part of something that was happening there, what do I mean by saying that? As I am not, I'm separate from what has happened to me and I'm able to observe it. Uh, but I recognize why it happened, you know, the purpose of that happening to me, the purpose that God has placed on my life and that I am anointed and that this message is important and people do need to hear it. And, you know, people like Cassie, she's anointed and that her message is powerful. The, the things that she's suffered and endured are terrible. Um but, you know, she has a purpose here and it's to help bring light to this music industry. And the downfall of P. Diddy, more and more and more victims are coming forward. And I, I said this, I said this about R. Kelly. I remember when R. Kelly was being convicted and people were like, oh, but do you believe it? I'm like, yes, I believe it because that's happened to me. And not only with this pimp and with the guy in Toronto, it's happened many times actually that men have approached me in vulnerable situations and, you know, told me, told me, not like kind of made it, you know, made me assume that that was going to happen. No, they word for word told me that if you want to be in this industry, you have to suck me. You have to fuck me. You have to do things with me. That's the only way that you're going to make it in this industry. And so I said when R. Kelly was being convicted, I said, oh yeah, a thousand percent, that's that's what happened. He abused and molested those girls and those and boys too. There's boys that are involved in this as well. And, you know, and I, I said, like, there's so many victims that haven't come forward, but, you know, there's a lot of shame that people carry. A lot. I even carry so much shame. There's a reason why I've never talked about these things, because it holds a lot of shame that I would involve myself in something like that. Because when you do those things, you're acting out of a place of vulnerability. You don't love yourself. You don't think you're worthy. You don't think you're enough. And so you're just attaching to these things like they're going to be your happiness, right? Um, and doing things out of character, doing things that you would never do. I would never, like in that I love myself, 
when you love yourself, you would never, you will never do things that are outside of your character. No is the most powerful word that you'll ever say is the word no, like no, immediately no. But when you're vulnerable, you don't love yourself and you have this dream they dangle it in front of you like a carrot and they hook you in easily by selling you a dream and then serving you shit on a silver platter. So this is only the beginning of the the shift in power dynamics in this industry and in other industries. And this is all God's will that the power is now being placed in the hands of the people that have been suffering from these circumstances and the people that have been in power no longer have their power because the light is so bright that they can't hide who they are anymore and these systems can no longer sustain themselves the people that support these systems can no longer support the systems themselves because the light is shining on them as well you know and so I just want to say Cassie like I'm proud of you I I'm proud of myself because I know how hard it is to come forward with these, uh, with the, the story of your life. And it, it holds a lot of shame. It holds a lot of, you know, just feeling, you know, like that you don't even want to relive it. You don't even want to, you're not even her anymore, you know? And I'm so happy that you found a man that just adores you oh my god I'm get emotional I'm so happy that you found a man that loves you with everything that you come with and is strong for you and and builds you up and brings that strength to you in your life because that's what you deserve and anybody that has ever been a victim to the music industry you deserve loving people in your life. You deserve happiness. You deserve to to feel peace in your life and to not carry that shame of the things that you've experienced. And so I hope that this message finds you well today. I know I've been very vulnerable in these past two episodes, guys. Um, thank you so much for being a part of my podcast journey. The, for those of you that made made it all the way to the end you guys please do not forget to like and share and subscribe to my channel please do like my channel uh, like the videos guys because uh it does help me grow in the algorithm so thank you so much for being here i hope you have an amazing beautiful positive day because you absolutely deserve it Try and explain it to the blind May you wake up from his eyes See the truth through the third eye Let your heart be your guide Light up the way Let your heart be your guide Free from your pain, it ain't a mistake Cause you choose your